I don't think my talk will be as entertaining as what Emmanuel was talking about. <laughs> um, um, I already introduced myself yesterday, so I'm a PhD student here. Um, till now, you have heard about semantics, uh, you've heard about annotation, you have you've heard about uh, filtering, queries. Most of the time, the discussion was that there was some textual data or there was some ontology that told you what knowledge exists about the domain. But there might be applications where you don't really have such knowledge that's already available. Um, and you may have to derive that knowledge from data, for example. Um, and things get challenging when there is sensor data involved and social data involved in one application. So what do I mean by that? So think about a traffic uh, road network. So there are sensors deployed on the road. There are thousands of them. So in Emmanuel's, Emmanuel gave a very comprehensive uh, uh, description of the types of data and the nature of big data itself. And one of the things he mentioned was coverage. And the other thing was about veracity, that is, how reliable these sensors are really. You don't know. Um, so connecting this kind of uh, sensor data with big data applications uh, is a very challenging uh, problem. And I'll be, ta I'll be talking about uh, certain concrete uh, applications and certain concrete uh, line of research we are trying to do with combining sensor data with textual data. And I'll also give you a rationale as to why you have to even combine these two. Why does it make sense? So let me start with a motivating example. Uh, so we, I was collecting uh, data from 511.org. So 511.org gives minute by minute real time updates of uh, traffic in San Francisco Bay Area. So it gives you information on average speed of vehicles passing through uh, many links, and it also gives you the volume. Uh, oh, sorry, it doesn't give you. It gives the travel time information for any, every link. You can think of link as a basic composing unit of the road network. So many links put together can form a road network. So this this data point you see here is for a particular link identified by one zero eight one five zero. Later on, I'll give you the name of the link, and here are the observations. So you have speed. Uh, strangely, it gives speed in kilometers per hour. <laughs> uh, ionically, that's SI. So I should be saying, fortunately, it gives in yeah. kilometers per hour. And here is the timestamp. So uh, it, it just means that the traffic is going a bit slow. And uh, uh, why, why do I say that it's going slow? Because this is the speed limit. But this is the actual speed being observed at this particular timestamp. So both of these. so. 51.org gives a variety of information. One of them is on the this kind of status update, link status update is what they call. Uh, they also give you description of the links. So this ID is nothing but 626th Avenue and uh, Hengensburg Road. So this is like the kind of link uh, that this particular ID is referring to. And you also have the policy restrictions like 104. Emmanuel even mentioned about some policy restrictions. So this is an example of a policy restriction on that link. So that's the recommended speed limit. People go over and below. Actually, I'll show you concrete data about how people are going above and below later. So I'm just taking a map, and I'm going to put these, uh, this particular link here. So you can see this. This is the link uh, that this uh, data belongs to. Here is an arena. So this is a sporting uh, arena. So then I was wondering why there is slow moving traffic at this particular location. Then I found that 511.org gives me that there is a baseball game at this particular location. Okay? So how do I explain this? So I can explain slow moving traffic using this event. right? However, there is also an alternative source of that event. I can go to the website of this particular arena and check the calendar. right? So I see that there is an event. Um, and that's what this date corresponds to here, right? So what do I, what what are we doing here? We are trying to explain sensor data variations or a dip in speed here with events from very different streams. This is sensor data. These are textual events. So those are two different things. So how do you put them together? How do you integrate these two things 
So that's the kind of question we are trying to ask uh, here. I'll also give you another example. So sorry, the image is not that clear here. So this is called the Ridgewood Road. And you're familiar with the red thing that you find on Google Maps. So it means that there is slow moving traffic, right? The, on Twitter, there is a tweet which says that there is an overturned semi at this particular location. And because of that, there is slow moving traffic. See how one stream is complementing the other, right? So you just know that there is slow moving traffic, but you don't know why. So this answers the why part. There's one more alternative source of information. There was a news report I could find, and that supports this slow moving traffic. But of course, the time at which this appears will probably much later compared to the tweet. This is also an excellent example of cyber physical social um, uh, or, or uh, physical cyber social you know, data and computing we talk about, right? So physical is the one, the uh, sensor thing, cyber, that this is cyber, and social, that is social. And increasingly, the class of applications that we go after have all the three types, which gives you um, significant more you know, variety. Uh, because as I have talked about in class, right, I mean, uh, one of the exciting thing about you know, a human uh, brain is that we can use, utilize all the sensors at the same time, all, all the different senses at the same time. And um, earlier, much of the computing only did um, processing of single type of data stream or data. And we want to, when, because we are, the whole you know, noise is about intelligent systems, smart systems. Uh, we want to elevate the level of abstraction at which we do the computation. Right? That pyramid I showed in the first uh, talk itself. And the whole idea is that, well, for that we need to be able to consume uh, data of different modality. And then we need to be able to um, uh, uh, connect them at the semantic level. And then we need to uh, you know, uh, have the deeper understanding, so develop a cognition from semantic cognition, and raise the level of abstraction, we call it perception. So we, another term uh, that we will see us increasingly talk about is um, uh, semantic computing, cognitive computing, and uh, uh, perceptual computing. And all the things will come together in our research portfolio. And this is a start, this is some of the early things in that. Yeah, towards that uh, like grand vision what Dokshat mentioned, whatever I'm going to present is like a very small part. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, so uh, how relevant is the news articles that you are using in the system since they are coming with a very long I mean, time after the new uh, the, after the thing that happens in the social media? So what is the how 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 significant is this? news article, for example. What if do you mean significant? After 10 minutes of the answer. Right, right. What is the use case and what are you using this for? This is just to say it's complement. Uh, I'm not claiming anything about the time, because it very much depends on the news agency and who's reporting it, right? Yeah. So there's, there might be latency in terms of reporting. So this is more like saying there is a reliable source if you want to verify the event. However, this is much more timely. So it depends on the trade-off between timeliness and how much you trust the source. But I guess it's, uh, it's, an, uh, it's a question of when do you need the, the, the data, right? Like for example, Waves, it gives you immediately after the uh, report of a user that there is something in the right port, right? Right. Uh -huh. But I mean, what is the use of this article if it comes later? Uh, it, it, it may be useful for a retrospective study. I'm not sure. So, so it depends on okay. what application and what is your, uh, what's the problem you're trying to solve. It depends yeah. entirely on that. So, so uh, later on, but I think it's a very good question. Your point, if I understand, is the fact that this article came the next day. Yes. Other data came at the, on the, around the same time. Right? Okay. Um, it will give a very good example that uh, they, he, he builds a model to understand this and figure out when there is an ob abnormality. So this is a ground truth. The article says much more precisely what it is for humans. And it, you know, uh, even though there is data in so uh, physical and social spheres, that article gives something much more concrete as humans understand it. So it becomes baseline. And in that sense, at least there is a, a value of it, even though that itself is not available to you in real-time decision making. But once the model is built, 
and test it. For testing of the model, for example, this is valuable. Then you can use that model on whatever partial stream of data that is available. Right? That's just one of the things you can do. And there is no reason uh, why, um, you know, in fact, today this is what you may see, but um, even the journalism, uh, what you will see is that uh, you know there is uh, going to be micro news articles rather than the you know news of once a day. Already news websites get updated multiple times a day today. So this is not necessarily going to be limited to too much farther down the line. Maybe one hour delay, maybe whatever it takes for humans to write that. I, I think I saw one example of this, like one article of a news. It gets updated, the same article, but it gets yeah. news like with this time, so. Yeah. In fact, that's a very important question and um, one of the topics that we had addressed in the past related to uh, on-topic content and off-topic content. So people misuse hashtags on Twitter. So we kind of use these news articles as a way to find out uh, how to cluster tweets that are really talking about a topic. So in fact, uh, this would be a way to, if you want to find some reliable uh, way of uh, dealing with uncertainty. So the question we want to ask is why multimodal data integration, right? I started my talk with, uh, I started with my uh, thing here saying that I want to combine textual data and uh, sensor data. So why do you want to do that? So one of the important thing to consider is the complementary uh, information. So sensor data gives you number and say that here is the number. But it's, it's, it's mostly quantitative, right? So we want qualitative interpretation of that number. So for example, in the first example, you saw that there was 27. That's the number which is kilometers per hour. But what does it mean? And how do you interpret that 27? So maybe combining textual data will let you interpret that particular data value. And in that first case, it was sporting event. So one is complementing the other. It can also be that one corroborates the other. So I'll, I'll give examples of uh, corroboration later. Um, so I'm just giving you why, what, and how of the problem. So this is why we want to address the multimodal integration problem. And uh, I'll show later uh, that this kind of integration is not well-defined. So we need to come up with techniques as to how to combine these two different streams together. Uh, going to the traffic domain, uh, the, there is a lot of work, uh, related work on predicting congestion using traffic uh, sensor data observations. But the focus that I'm going to have is more on interpretation, like understanding the root cause, why, why there is a traffic jam, not on prediction to say. However, the models we are trying to build, I'll tell you uh, later, I'll also mention that it's, it, it can be used for prediction, but I'm not claiming anything there. So we are combining, uh, I'll, show the, I'll show experiments, but we're combining 511.org, Twitter. Both of these uh, are two uh, sources of information. And in both, we can look at textual data and sensor data. So those are the uh, high level uh, separation between the types of data. So here are the three things uh, I want to uh, talk about today. Uh, how are we going to achieve this, this kind of integration of sensor and social data? First, we need to extract events, right? We, we have a lot of Twitter data, but we don't know what events really exist. Just because if I have tweets, it doesn't mean that I have events. Because there's a lot of noise. Um, maybe there are tweets that are not relevant, like Pawan mentioned about filtering. Uh, so there are a lot of challenges here. That's the first part. Second part, you need to, you need to be able to model the sensor data. So without modeling sensor data, you don't know when there is deviation from normalcy. So the idea is that you are able to describe the sensor data using a model. And you can use those models to find out if there is an anomaly and use these extracted events to explain those anomalies. So this is the overall idea. And then how do we explain? You're doing exceptions also. The fact that I'm adding doesn't mean that you didn't. No, no, it's fine. But yeah. um, I think this is a very significant thing. right? Um, uh, there is so much data being generated. What data should I pay attention to? It's a very fundamental issue, right? And where does, you know, it will be typically when there is a, an anomalous uh, event, anomalous uh, condition, that perhaps it is of some interest or some significance for human decision making or for us to take an action. 
So uh, the process of building the normal um, uh, you know, behavior, understand the normal behavior, where the data is this of different modality, is a very complex one. And to create that model and then use that model to against the data that comes in real time to identify the anomaly is a very fundamental thing. We, we so far, you know, a lot of things we only talked about is like how do I analyze all the stuff I talked about in the treatise is what do I see, you know, right now what patterns I see, but this is uh, you know further significant advance towards the thing, right? So um, uh, just think about uh, your observing um, things around you, surrounding you, and if there's something very unusual happens just outside this window, suddenly your attention will go there. Right? How do you identify that, that is unusual? How do you want machines to identify that is unusual? And you need to pay attention to. It goes again, again towards a, a key thing that we are pursuing called perceptual computing. Can I say something? Yeah. It's interesting how this problem is actually uh, bef comes before what we saw through spin processing yesterday and today with Sparkle, for example, because you are. Um, are, uh, you are wondering to have reacti reactiveness, but I mean the, the trigger matters. So I have to retrieve such an information. So like, we can build system, the smart system, that are rule based, and they can actually do everything on the fly. And there we point our attention on the re uh, responsibility requ requirement. But there are a lot of work before that you need to know to build such a you know such a, a pipeline. You know. And that's exactly complementary on that part. And yeah, that's what I was just thinking to add. Yeah. It definitely is complementary for sure. Yeah. The, the other point, though, you want to recognize is that if you're making a rule-based system, that means what you are doing is what we call top-down processing or top-down computation. Hmm. It's a human knowledge about what is normal, what is abnormal. Typically, the rules will identify what is abnormal or what is different and how you want to uh, identify that uh, abnormal situation. Here, what he's doing is to build things bottom up. He is analyzing data over a long period of time, as you'll see as he goes into his thing, and then uh, tries to characterize things that are more. So um, uh, both of them have their roles, and ideal situation is to do both. Uh, there's all, and all this um, uh, uh, cognitive modeling work on top brain versus bottom brain. I was thinking the same. And yes. <laughs> So one of the other aspects about anomaly detection is that it has to be non-parametric. Like Dokshet mentioned about multiple streams. So currently I'm dealing with one, per one stream which is speed uh, and travel time. So there are two streams. Uh, but it has to be mostly non-parametric. What do I mean? So mostly you can't describe anomalies based on rules unless you know it. Like you can't just, <coughs> you can't know what is anomalous unless you know what is normal. So how do you deal with such a challenge that you have a lot of data, but you don't know what anomaly is, you have to learn normalcy model for an extended period of time. So we have like 1.4 billion data points collected for a year for all the sensors, around 3,000 uh, sensors in the San Francisco Bay Area. And we build normalcy models on that. So I'll go to the uh, next uh, steps later. But however, just to emphasize, there are three steps I'll talk about. First one is extracting events building statistical models on sensor data. Third one is correlating these two uh, results of these two uh, processing. Let me go to extraction. So what, what do you mean by it has to be non-parametric? So non-parametric is, for example, how many of you are familiar with Gaussian distribution? Gaussian? Partially. OK, a Gaussian distribution is uh, very well known. Um, Let's say if I ask all of you about your uh, weight or age, and I plot it on a graph. So most likely, there will be clustering, and there will be some, uh, there are very less people, uh, maybe who are like very young, and there are very less people who are very old. So Listing bell curve. Yeah, it's called bell curve. Bell curve right? The other, yeah. So bell curve or Gaussian distribution. So. With Gaussian distribution, you need to specify the mean and uh, variance. So or, or rather, these are the two parameters that define a Gaussian distribution. But if I ask you what is anomalous, 
observation, you might say that, okay, there is, if you go away from mean long enough, you might land up with an anomaly. But the question is, what is that mean and variance? You don't know. So you have to find that out from data. And that's why it's non-parametric. That is, I'm not defining any parameter for the system. I'm letting the models that I build figure out the parameters from data. So that's why it's non-parametric. Okay. So you can, uh, there are various departments in a city. So I was just curious and I wanted to find out how many of these uh, tweets really talk about various departments. So uh, this is from IBM, like these are the departments, uh, various, like water, uh, sewage treatment, then there is uh, 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 public safety, then there is traffic. I'll be focusing mostly on such tweets, but I could find tweets for most of the departments. And people talk about various aspects in, uh, and their experiences in a city on uh, Twitter for sure. There are various challenges. I'll not uh, talk too much about this. Dakshit already mentioned about these challenges. Emmanuel also mentioned about these challenges. So in event extraction, there are various uh, aspects. Uh, so one of the challenges that I'm, I'm going to use Twitter for event extraction. So that's fa that falls under informal text. And there is formal text. Formal text can be like news articles, for example. Uh, informal text, and there is open domain and closed domain. So open domain means that you don't know the event types to start with. So in a city, I don't know what are the event types, for example. And closed domain is something like you already know a set of events that you are interested in. So this is the overall uh, processing uh, pipeline for extracting events. So I, had, I take all these tweets. And the red lines here are probably related to city infrastructure. So I have two steps. First one is annotation. Second one is event extraction. And this uses um, a probabilistic model for, sorry. This uses a model of uh, annotation. Um, there are various uh, techniques to annotate data. So you could identify entities in a tweet. And Dakshit spoke about some challenges in doing so. Uh, uh, fortunately for Twitter uh, and specifically for traffic events, I could get knowledge about various locations in a city. I could get event types related to uh, city infrastructure. So I use these models to uh, complement uh, entity extractor. And I use uh, a technique for annotate. I use the entity extractor for annotation. Then I use city event extraction uh, algorithm over the annotated uh, tweets. So th there, is, there are a lot of details involved. There is a uh, ACM transactions paper on this, so you can look it up. So the link is right here. So just to give you a quick overview of this. Uh, so this is uh, describing what we did for this paper. Uh, we had around 8 million tweets. and. Uh, 162 million data points and like around 170 events from 511. Um, I'll talk about a much larger scale experiment in the next phase. Uh, the evaluation had three parts. So there are there is textual stream, there is sensor data, right? But in this experiment, I'm taking textual stream from Twitter, and I'm taking textual stream from a formal source like 511. I want to compare these two. That is, 511 already gives me all the events in a city. And I have twi tweets, and I have extracted some events. How do I compare? How do I know that I'm doing well or not? So I need to compare what I extract with what is the ground truth. So I treat 511 events as ground truth. So the green dots here are 511 events. Can you see from that? The green dots are 511 here. And the red dots here are the events that I have extracted from Twitter. So I evaluate based on three measures. One is complementary. Uh, I was telling you that one uh, textual stream, uh, or rather these two complementary in the sense that one is giving an additional uh, information about the event. And I'll give you examples of each of these in the next few slides. Uh, corroborative is one is supporting the other. So let's say I found an accident in a Twitter stream. I extracted an accident event. Then I found that there was an accident from 511 stream. So that's what is corroborative. And I, the third aspect is timeliness. So I expect that sometimes Twitter might give you timely uh, report of incidents. Because 511 has to go through some process for that to get published. Whereas Twitter is direct information. People just talk about accidents. 
So this is the other aspect that uh, we are going to look at. So here is an example. So in this case, the left one is the 511 event. The right one is the Twitter event. The left one says road construction. And there is some timestamp here associated with that. So I look at the tw uh, event that I have extracted from Twitter, and it, it talks about traffic issues. So people are talking about traffic, and these two are complementary. So because there was probably road construction, there is some issue with flow of traffic. And here is another example. So the right one here is the 511 event, which is road construction. And there is, again, traffic. So that was complementary. And now let's look at corroborative. That is, one supports the other. So the left one is the event I extracted from Twitter. It says accident. The right one is also an accident. So these two, this particular event I extract from Twitter is supporting what I have from 511. So similarly, I have for fog. So this is from San Francisco Bay Area. So they seem to have some uh, fog issues. Uh, often I see a lot of those. And here is an example of timeliness. So you could find, you could see that the yeah, the, the, this particular event appeared before this. So you could see that people talk about events very quickly on Twitter, and you could potentially extract events before uh, it even appears on 511. So that was the first part, extracting events from textual uh, or Twitter. Specifically, I focused on city events, city event extraction here. Next, I'll talk about the statistical model and what, do I, what is this all normalcy models about. So, all I want to convey in this section is that there are various techniques for uh, characterizing normalcy, uh, but uh, we'll probably rely on a few of them. So this x-axis is time, and y-axis is speed. So this is the variation of speed on August 4th of 2014, 4th to 5th. And uh, you can see that it's very nonlinear. Like, it's all over the place, right? But there might be some events that are probably causing this kind of uh, variation. So how do we integrate these two is the question of interest. And the influence might be varying. One accident might result in a larger dip, whereas uh, uh, time of the day might result in a smaller uh, dip. So what are the reasons for causing uh, for these no nonlinearities, right? So just the P cover, like because traffic is very much common sense driven, so I could just give you some examples and convince you why this is nonlinear. So temporal landmarks, that is P cover, morning P cover and evening P cover might result in uh, speed dips. The location of the link also matters. The downtown links might be much more crowded than, let's say, a uh, suburban link. And there might be many events surrounding uh, these links. That is, there may be many events in the city, and all those things result in such nonlinearities in data. And there might be unexpected events, like accidents, that which might also cause uh, uh, all these things. But this is a very stochastic domain. Like There is so much randomness involved. That is, there are some events. Sometimes it might result in a delay, and sometimes it may not. Right? So if the link is not at all occupied, then you don't expect delays, for example. So this is my favorite uh, quote. So all models are wrong, but some are useful. So I'm not claiming that I'm going to model traffic data faithfully, but I can make a theoretical argument as to why certain model works well. Uh, the normalcy model, I, I have three models mentioned here. Uh, I've used the last model here, which is called the linear dynamical system model. So I use this. Uh, but I'll give you a sample of what these first two models are. But actually, I'll give you an example only about the first uh, model here. So this is AT&T Park in San Francisco. Uh, this is the Bay Bridge. Can you see that bridge there? So there is a link that's close to this particular arena here. So this is the link I'll be talking about in my next few slides. I'll show the data that we collected for this link. So here is the data that I've collected for uh, one day. So from uh, 1st June to 2nd June 2014. So what does this indicate? The x-axis, this is a histogram. How many of you are familiar with histogram? 
most of you. So it's just a way of bucketing your uh, sample space and looking at how many observations are present in each of those buckets. So the y-axis here is the number of observations you found, and x-axis is the speed. So you can see that uh, there are people, so this particular link is here, this one, the Bay Bridge. So it's right somewhere here on this road. Oops, sorry. So this is, uh, oops. So start time and end time, and there is a speed limit of 80. So th these, this information here, I got it from 511. So what does this really indicate, right? So let me try to explain this histogram and try to connect up with some real world common sense that all of us have. So most drivers tend to drive five kilometers or uh, six kilometers over the speed limit. Like when we drive, we normally drive a little over the speed limit, at least that's what is my... Not you. <laughs> I drive five over, I think. <laughs> that's why I put five here. So here, uh, very less people drive very fast, maybe like Ricardo, they, yeah. they drive really fast, <laughs> but there are very less people like that. Um, <laughs> but there are, there are situations where both Ricardo and I are forced to drive slowly when there is traffic. I don't know if you'll hit and oh, move over. <laughs> so anyway, so this is the kind of clustering you see. So how you can see that a common sense that you have about a domain translates to the data that you already have. Do you think this resembles any distribution, probability distribution? Gaussian distribution? Do you think it's a Gaussian distribution? I, I see one nod. And uh, where you not, where you, is it, do you say yes or no? Is it a Gaussian? I say no. Perfect. So that's my next slide. So it's actually a combination of Gaussians. Like you can approximate it. Uh, again, I don't say that it's the model. So it's an approximation. So there are multiple Gaussians that you can use to describe this particular uh, data. Uh, I have some experiments, but I'm not going to any detail here. So let me describe what these, this slide is about. So this is a racing track or racing arena. This is in San Francisco again. What you see here is the calendar for this particular arena. This is the July 2014 calendar. And there are no events in that particular month. This is for June 2014. The green things you see here are the events. Okay, So I have some algorithm that takes this particular approximation and then computes a score for this month and this month. I have almost a year worth of data. And the models I build is over the entire year. And when I build a normalcy model, I try to exclude those observations that really have events in them. So I have a normalcy model. And I have these two months. So what do I expect? Which one is close to normalcy? What do you guys expect? Is this close to normalcy? Or is this close to normalcy? The first month first. Perfect. So that's what I have here. So I have some scores. Uh, you, it's called log likelihood score. So if it's fine. It's just a way of saying how closely a particular data is being generated by a distribution that you already know. Anyway, this is a mess, uh, but I'm just going to explain what is this. So I'm, I'm moving on from, this was based on GMM, uh, but let me move on and tell you why GMM is not enough. So here is an hourly distribution of, uh, so let's say I have six months of data. I take every Monday, right, and every hour of Monday. So there are 24 hours in a Monday, and let's say there are uh, four into six Mondays, right? I plot those data points here. So for every hour, you see this is the first hour of the day. That is 12 AM to 1 AM in the morning, 1 AM to 2, till 11 to 12, uh, 12 AM, 11 PM to 12 AM. So do you see a pattern? Don't worry, I spent one day figuring out the pattern here. So this is the green box you see here. You can see that the speeds are almost around 80 to 90 kilometers per hour. So it's kind of following a normalcy to say. But there are situations in day where the, there is dip in speed. So you can see that, uh, for example, 7 to 8 AM in the morning, there is a dip. 8 to 9, there is a, there is a decrease. 
So it, it kind of satisfies our intuition that people are traveling to work and things like that. And the evening, there is like really slow moving traffic. So GMM model doesn't capture this kind of dynamics. GMM, how many of you are familiar with IID assumption? Independent and identically distributed. So, so these, uh, these probabilistic models here, like GMM, it assumes that every data point was generated independently which is not true here, right? Because it's a time series. So my current speed depends on the previous speed. It's not completely independent. So it kind of violates some theoretical assumptions that GMM has. So, so let me just give you a quick uh, glance of various statistical models. Uh, so if I had to model traffic dynamics, I need to be able to differentiate various dynamics, that is decreasing, increasing, steady. So I need to be able to distinguish all these, and I can't do using GMM. Maybe autoregressive might help, but there is a second thing here which says account for unobserved factors. How many events that I can be really sure of that I have information about? And uh, Emmanuel mentioned this in his talk. There is a lot of noisy and uncertain data throughout various applications. So in case of traffic, maybe I have partial events, Maybe I don't have all the events that I really need to know to analyze my data. So autoregressive models is another very, uh, very popular way of analyzing data, uh, time series data. And it doesn't capture this kind of intuition that we want, where we want to account for the hidden factors. So we use something called linear dynamical systems, which does the job. So I'm going to skip over the details. Uh, all you need to know here is that we take one year worth of data build a model. This is the model. And I have it for every link in the road network, which is around 3,500 links, and every hour of day and every day of week. So I build these models based on one year worth of data. And in the next slide, I'll utilize this model. It's here. And I take data, and I just tag anomalies. You, you need not know all the details, but all you need to remember is that I'm tagging anomalies here. Okay. And there is a way to tag anomaly. That's fine. It's not important to this conversation. So I take these anomalies. Remember these anomalies I just told. And then I have these events that I have extracted from Twitter. Now I'm trying to explain uh, these anomalies utilizing the events that I have from uh, Twitter. So I have some algorithm to do that. And this is just, uh, I just submitted to a conference. Uh, it's a conference paper recently submitted. So we spoke about big data, right? So and stream reasoning was the major uh, thing. So I just want to emphasize some of the uh, data challenges that we had in this. Uh, and Surendra here in the audience actually was instrumental in implementing what we had on Spark. So we have a very uh, huge cluster here. And uh, this has around 800 cores and 17 terabytes of main memory. So. Without this implementation, we couldn't have evaluated for the size of data we have. So we have around, uh, so I told you that there is 511.org and Twitter data, both, right? So in 511, we have around 1,600 incident reports. And sensor data is really huge. We have like 1.4 billion speed and travel time observations. So that's a lot. And it's very hard to deal with this kind of uh, size. Uh, then we have extracted around uh, 39,000 traffic related events for an entire year. So all this data here is for a year, from May 2014 to May 2015. So this is a year worth of uh, both Twitter data and 511 data. So just to give you a perspective, so I use my laptop. Uh, my laptop is 8 gigs of RAM, and then it's a dual core machine. Uh, if I run all these experiments, it would take like two months for me to finish experiments on my uh, laptop. but with the Spark implementation, it runs within like 24 hours. So this is the kind of uh, scale up that's required. And this is not a real time system yet. So if you want to make such a real time leap, I think it's a very challenging problem. And I'm looking forward to that. But basically, though, you know, only you need all this computing power for creating the model. Once you create the model to identify exception, you can still do it in real time with much less power, right? Uh, yes, I have a breakup for this. Oh. Uh, there are two steps in creating the model. The first one is learning the uh, LDS model, uh, yeah. this part. Mm. Uh, this takes around uh, 
14 15 minutes for one link mm. and this this particular thing takes another 10 minutes for learning the normal C model however as you said when I have to just test it on a data set it's pretty much instantaneous right like it's right. So it's those two, two things to taking several minutes per link uh, that would be done only uh, infrequently right uh, yeah periodically. yeah 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 so uh, if you have to build if you have to build normal C model and then uh, like there are two steps as I mentioned that would take a lot of time but when you have the model and you have the data coming in pretty much you can say whether it's anomalous or not just it's probably con constant time because uh, the other good thing about traffic domain is that it's embarrassingly parallel. That is, I can parallelize uh, very easily. Uh, so that's one of the other advantages of such a problem we have. And here are some evaluations I had. Um, anybody wants to take a guess why I could? So okay, let me just explain this could quick. You, could you explicitly model, uh, you know, uh, uh, set up such that you put uh, four links per core kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Surendra worked on uh, customizing the uh, jobs. Like you can customize uh, what kind of uh, jobs you want to spread across the cluster. So you could do pretty much that kind of flexibility is there. So just to explain quickly, like five minutes maybe. So so there is a lot of uh, Emmanuel also mentioned about coverage. So there is a huge issue of coverage. That is. I don't expect that there are sensors on all possible roads, right? So how do, you, how do you deal with this kind of challenge? So we said that, OK, we can't help. I can't go and deploy sensors. So whatever information I have, what best I can do? So here, um, so 33% of uh, events from uh, 511 had complete data that I want from sensor data stream. Uh, even partially missing or completely missing data, I just ignored them. Uh, similarly, for Twitter events, uh, I only, uh, like around 2% of Twitter events. But Twitter events are huge. Like I have 40,000 of them. Uh, people might report a like, lot of events. And it's really uh, dispersed across the city. It's not just focused on one part where sensors are deployed. So because of that, I have uh, missing data. But in within this 33% and 2%, right? here is the corresponding anomalies I could find in sensor data. So I have. 33% uh, of these events, right? So in that I could, uh, so considering that as 100%, I could explain 70% of anomalies. That is, when I find an event in the Twitter stream, I could find a corresponding anomaly in sensor data. But with Twitter, it's even higher. So I could find, uh, most of the cases I could find anomalies. Do you guys want to take a guess why this is more and this is less? Because humans are really taken care of uh, just making a judgment, right? Uh, yes, uh, there is one more aspect that uh, people don't complain till it's bothering them. But that, that's what I mean. That they, they, yeah. You won't say this is normal. I'm not going to report on. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. They are not like, going to, you know, uh, but the only when there's uh, something newsworthy. Right. Right. Or right. Share, you know, what's yeah. with others. Right. But this is like a formal channel, so they have to report everything. So maybe because of that is what we thought. Anyway, any questions? And thanks a lot for listening. I think I ran. Uh, Normal C during one day, right? Or on your one year uh, of data, mm. your model is uh, uh, a model that is valid for one day of behavior or the whole year. So I use one year of data, okay. but I use like very contextual models. That is, I build around four hundred thousand models for. Okay, it's, okay. It's, it's road based. Okay. It's link based. It's R based, day based. Like I have like four hundred thousand models built for whatever I want. So if you tell me, if you give me an observation, okay. I'll derive some metadata from that, and I choose a model that's appropriate and apply that. OK, the question, that comes to the question. The, if you're thinking in, to apply this in a streaming context, do you think that uh, the window or the chunk of data I use to uh, ask mm -hmm. the model if I to annotate are relevant for the final decision? Or I mean, is the model that we window independent no I it is that. windowed it is early models okay so just with early models i had so many challenges to deal with if you want to have minute by minute it's a very different uh, thing so with lds so it's both uh, is model is both uh, link based uh, time based 
and he has each link, each hour. Day based, you like know. what is the day of week, what is the hour of day, okay, so what is the link you're talking about. So all those indexes would matter. How I build separate models. How do you pick the appropriate model? Uh, I, I, so let's say you give me data now. So I look at what is the current, uh, what is the location of the link, First. like for, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? right? And I'll, I'll find out what is the day of week today, and what is hour of day. So I take all these as indexes and pick the appropriate model from what I've learned for an entire year. Which model pr would actually predict the anomaly? The model that you pick. So let me go back here. Actually, I'll. Uh, like the way you choose the model, it should be. So here, right? Well so the so this is for a link. There's one link. This is for only one link. Okay. So there is day of week, hour of day, 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week, 168 models. Okay. Now multiply this by number of links. Thousands. Yeah. I understand. Hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands. Yeah. And that's why you just okay. And yeah. So did you did that answer your question? So I take day of week, hour of day, and I pick a model from this matrix, let's say. And I use that for computing the log likelihood score for the current observation. Hmm. And, and actually, I skip the complete uh, thing about how do I have anomaly uh, for time reasons. So, but there is a way to figure out whether the log likelihood score is within bounds or not. So it's in the, in the tool that I'm giving now, if you want. We are using 1.92 million models for a similar topic. The, the, the thing is, it's very relevant. We have to cut, cut. down the cut. space, which is an n-dimensional space, and decide uh, about to sample it. Yeah? yeah, and also the way you cut also kind of depends on your knowledge of the domain. For example, how did I know that I had to cut based on day and hour? It's just common sense about traffic. But that may not be true if you go to a different domain. I don't know if you're going to address that. but. Definitely, that's a very different uh, problem. So the question is, linear dynamical systems are fine, but how are you going to cut this data into smaller chunks? And how, how do you know you have to cut in a certain way? So it's an important uh, question to ask. Uh, 